Come on up, next panel, TradFi to DeFi. So we've talked about legal and regulatory environment with global implications. Come on up, you guys, have a seat. And uh, then we talked about infrastructure and institutional traders. Um, and now the intersection between TradFi and DeFi with Circle, BankProv, BDO. Uh, unfortunately, the American Crypto Academy couldn't come because of an illness. So Nina Kaplan with the New Jersey Digital Assets Group, take it away, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, hello, Boston. It's, I'm really excited to be here. The Boston Blockchain Association is really a terrific group. Um, so, and we have a, a very interesting panel. We're talking about um, institutional adoption of digital assets. So I'll introduce, so I'm Nina Kaplan. I'm chair of the New Jersey Digital Assets Working Group. Um, our panel is, we've got Cash Rasagi, Chief Revenue Officer of Circle. You got it. Thanks for, for being here. And we've got in the middle, Steve um, McConnell, Head of Sales BSO. And we've got Joe Monsini, COO of BankProv. Thanks very much for being here. So um, yeah, it's been a tough uh, few weeks with the FTX debacle the Sam Bankman Freed media apology tour. Um, it's been very, uh, it's interesting to watch. Um, it's definitely going to complicate the institutional adoption of digital assets. Um, cash, Circle issues the USDC stablecoin, which is the world's fifth largest digital assets. Let's start by first understanding what exactly is a stable coin and how can institutions leverage it? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm actually quite excited about the adoption of, of digital assets by institutions and I think USCC represents a vehicle for them to, to really take advantage of what's available on the open blockchain. Uh, USDC, as you mentioned, is the fifth largest digital asset in the world. Um, it is a full reserve stable coin, meaning it's entirely backed by cash and short-term US treasuries. Um, we launched USDC about four and a half, five years ago. Uh, today there's about 43 billion in circulation. Um, it, is, uh, it is managed by BlackRock, it is custodied uh, by Bank of New York Mellon entirely within the US regulatory perimeter. Um, and what's really exciting about USDC, and we, we keep hearing about this at Circle around the use cases for digital assets and the use cases for, for stablecoin, is for the first time ever, you're able to use the open internet and the public blockchain to transmit value around the world the same way that we transmit information and video content and messaging. Um, and so we think USDC provides a really interesting vehicle to that next generation of payments, which we'll talk about. Um, but that's really what our, what our business is, is, is built on. Uh, in addition to USDC, we've also launched a, a Euro coin, which is a Euro denominated uh, fiat backed stable coin uh, six months ago. And you can imagine, uh, envision a future where, where Circle launches more fiat backed stable coins in major regions around the world, specifically for this use case to move away from the speculative asset, um, uh, the speculative phase of, of crypto trading more to the real world utility. That's what we think USDC and other stable coins represent. Great. Um, yeah, it's, they're pretty, play a pretty important role in the ecosystem and Circle is really a leader. Um, Steve, you um, play an interesting role. Your company um, does interesting things in the ecosystem. Can you tell us a little bit about it? And you're, you're on the physical infrastructure side. Can you tell us a little bit how physical infrastructure can increase confidence in crypto markets? Sure. <clears throat> so um, I tend to think of our role as a little bit boring. Uh, uh, we're, we're basically the plumbers underneath uh, everything that everybody is doing here. Um, 
but we have physical infrastructure around the world and we connect all of the TradFi exchanges uh, for the past 15 years and we've been in crypto for the last five or so. Uh, and we connect the crypto exchanges as well into our network. Uh, and what we are, have been doing is uh, adding more efficiencies into the crypto space uh, by having more efficient connectivity between uh, the venues themselves, the users of the venues uh, with deterministic latency and more of a stable platform to work from. Um, and we've seen quite a bit, especially over the last two years, uh, where crypto venues have been moving more and more to adopt some physical infrastructure for that stability. And we're also seeing the traditional exchanges, NASDAQ, ICE, CME especially, uh, starting to move into the virtual space as well. Uh, so it's a really interesting hybrid of virtual and physical that is happening as we speak. Absolutely, and it's, it's one that people don't think about necessarily, but it's, it really plays a crucial role. So Joe, um, what obstacles are really limiting a more widespread adoption of digital assets, do you think? Good question, Nina. <laughs> um, thanks for having me here. Uh, so Bank Prov, you know, to answer that question, I think maybe take a step back. So sometimes boring is a good thing in this space, right? And we've learned that um, may not be a bad thing, but so Bank Prov provides um, technology-driven solutions where commercial bank to traditional and niche markets like fin fintechs and digital asset-related companies. And so as we kind of take a step back and review what obstacles perhaps, we've had conversations with companies all over the spectrum in this, in this space. And so for us, it's looking at things like, certainly we've heard the regulatory environment. That's a big factor here, right? So uh, banks want to get into this space. Uh, not all, but banks want to get into this space. And in order for that to happen and that adoption needs to, needs to really be driven by a framework. So for us to be able to continue to do this as we've done it, we've seen, um, based on these conversations, what's needed in the market. Based on that, we've been able to put together a framework from a regulatory perspective, from a risk perspective, and really drive home those needs. Um, I think beside from, aside from that, there's the educational piece, the awareness. So I, I think there's still a, a lot of myth out there about what crypto is and what digital, digital assets are. And I think it's just making people aware of what the true value is behind it. And, it's not just this investments piece of it where people I think are just focusing so much on today and the mainstream uh, media. It really is a catalyst for things like USDC and stable coins and cross-border payments and, and really just driving that piece of it, efficiency across the board. Um, we think about technology, right? For a bank like ours, a $2 billion bank, we have our own in-house development team. So for us, we're able to develop the technology that's needed to interact with companies in this space. So whether it's APIs or looking at things like blockchain and, and driving home those needs based on technology. And I would say, you know, that's, those are probably the biggest things and, and probably almost as important as the human capital, which again, we've heard earlier, it's, it's hiring the right people. It's building the foundation from a team perspective to be able to showcase to the examiners and to the regulatory bodies that you're not doing this just because it's a, it's a hot topic issue. You're doing this, you're, you're thinking through the process, you're bringing the right people in to help build this for the future in the right setting in that space. So, great, thank you. Yeah, I would. I would just um, add to your point. I would give the crypto ecosystem an F in terms of being able to articulate the value proposition of crypto. Most people, when they think about crypto, they think about some crypto bros and you know in their in their attic uh, trading and 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 becoming overnight millionaires or losing it all. Um, and what's really happening and, and what we're seeing at Circle is that real infrastructure is being built for real world use cases. Um, several months or last year, 
uh, during the right in the in the in the peak of COVID, uh, there were many many um, uh, 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 initiatives that that were uh, that were undertaken using USCC. Uh, for one, uh, in the country of Venezuela, uh, USCC was used to provide aid for for on the ground workers, uh, completely bypassing the the banking regime in Maduro to give US aid to give aid to to, to uh, workers uh, that that were helping that were helping um, uh, uh, many of the citizens there. And so that's just one. One, that's just one example. Today, uh, there's a lot. There's there's a, a huge relief effort for Ukraine, uh, for, with with uh, businesses around the world uh, really donating to, to provide resources with with for citizens in U, in Ukraine, bypassing government, bypassing the the, the the banking institutions. And so, I think the the ecosystem as as, as a whole um, really needs to step up. And I think hopefully we can get past the speculative phase and more into real world use cases, which I'm excited to talk about. That I think stable coins unleash. But there's a lot of businesses that are building real world applications. Spotify is getting into crypto. Nike is getting into crypto. Why are these companies doing it? It's not because of the speculative asset. It's because there's real value in being able to move payments on chain. There's real value in being able to to to, to make sure ownership is detected. Um, and maintained throughout the life cycle of the digital assets that you create. Um, so this is something that we're quite excited about, and and hopefully um, the the branding that crypto has will evolve in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Those are are really good points. The use cases are really interesting, and Circle is really, you know, at the forefront of a lot that's going on. Um, so I think I'm, it's back to you anyway. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, USDC is, is a critical infrastructure um, piece for crypto. And what advantages does it have over sending and receiving regular bank dollars? I think that's key point to the digital asset. Uh, right. I mean, when you, when you think about innovation or lack thereof, I would say the the, the payments systems and, and and the ability to move money around the world has been an antiquated industry for quite some time. I mean, if you think about uh, settlement rails today, there's two trillion annually that's sucked up in interchange fees and processing fees, two trillion dollars. And so, what blockchain does is enable money to move around the world at the speed of the internet with 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 secured uh, security and, and transmittability. And so that's what I think the the, the value of, of, of blockchain brings to to payments innovation. Um, and so we're quite excited about about what that can represent in terms of real world application. And we hear this question a lot is like, what's the use case for USDC? What's the use case for digital assets? I would pose the question, what's the use case for a dollar? What's the use case for being able to exchange value um, for and and around the world? And so, what we're seeing today, um, you mentioned some of them, uh, cross-border payments, uh, where businesses might have branches around the world um, and they want to move money internally. Uh, blockchain and stablecoin allows them to do that. Um, there is, you know, obviously the NFT movement, where where digital owners can maintain their rights and ownership over their NFTs and move money around the world easily that way. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of applications that that I think are being built. Right Right now, today, Twitter, if you wanted to go and tip your favorite content creator, you can do so using USDC. They have content creators around the world. Some of these content creators are, are in regions uh, that are either underbanked or not banked at all, and they're leveraging digital wallets and USDC to earn a living. That's happening today, and it's not being reported on as much as, as much as I think it could be. And so I think that's the value of USDC. That's the value of truly fiat-backed fully reserved stable coins, the ability to move value um, and, and, and create an economy that I don't think has existed before. Exactly. So just one thing I wanted to, to point or comment on is the speed of the internet um, is interesting, but um, there are faster methods than the internet, um, which TradFi has already had in place for 20 years. So the, the, the space that we're filling is bringing that physical infrastructure to support those applications uh, with more stability, improved latency, better efficiencies, which we feel will bring more participants into that space, which will close spreads uh, on trading uh, books uh, and have much better execution for participants across the board. So that's... As boring as being a plumber, 
uh, is, that's our vision for uh, where crypto is going. I mean, Circle, we're, we're a stablecoin infrastructure provider, so I'm with you uh, on the infrastructure game and being boring. Being boring uh, in a world that, re that requires it, I think, is a good thing. Um, but, but absolutely, the infrastructure is being built, and I think that's the, the, the meta point that, that we're trying to make here, is that while the headlines are gloom and doom, and it's a really bad time, I would say, for crypto, there are real-world applications. There's really important infrastructure being built with mainstream trillion-dollar businesses that are beginning to enter crypto. And so we might not see the immediate ramifications over the course of the next two months, three months, six months, but it is happening and it will happen. Well, to that point too, we've seen just an increase in, in banking in general around instant payments, right? So I, I think uh, folks have learned that they can hold on to their cash a little bit longer, especially in certain companies, especially small businesses. And so in order to do that, I think, you know, we look at the legacy systems today in banking, it's very difficult. You send a wire, it takes three days to process, you're getting fees left and right. Um, and that's just a piece of it, right? So, and this is a perfect example of how stablecoin could, you know, potentially solve that issue. Instant, you know, uh, secure, very a fraction of the cost and eliminates a lot of those concerns there. And, and you know, and we look at uh, real life use cases here, the whole fiasco with Taylor Swift and those tickets, right? Um, to bring that up, I mean, you talk about, I read something last week on how NFTs could solve a problem like that. Right, so it's. I think there's so many use cases here, and I think for for a bank, it's just trying to to figure out which process, which product really will be the 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 one that solves the need in the space. And there's so many pot, uh, potential out there. Yeah, the use cases are are really interesting, and what better way to demonstrate the transformative potential of the technology than through these use cases? Um, and Steve, I think also, you know, the infrastructure, you know, is, you say, is um, a little boring, but I think we talked about ways in which it can really increase consumer confidence, um, knowing about, you know, more about the infrastructure. Well, absolutely. So you referenced the um, crypto bros in their, their attic or their basement trading on the internet. Right. Uh, if people understood that these were large institutions who were physically connected together, um, supporting all of this underlying infrastructure, I think that would change the minds and the perception of of the general public. And I think um, retail acceptance of this will certainly support institutional adoption. Uh, I don't think it's the dog wagging the tail necessarily. But it goes hand in hand. So, uh, and to your point earlier, an F for how they market it, uh, you know, crypto, <laughs> I agree. Uh, so if we can get this message out, you know, I think it, it'll certainly help. I think people have to see it happen. It's it's not just about the the, the, the articles and, and, the, and the interviews. It's, to, they have to feel the pain. Um, and I think today uh, merchants are really starting to feel the pain that have global businesses around being able to move money around the world. You can feel the pain on how long it takes to send the wire overseas. You can feel that pain. You can feel the pain of the cost that it takes. So the problem is, is that there's not yet a network around the world that is operating on, like, on chain. And so when you receive a token, when you receive a digital asset, what are you going to do with it? You can either hold it or you have to try to move back out to fiat. And so that's what I think the ecosystem is building today. We're building that network that brings, brings together people so they can really start to take advantage of these digital assets and move out of the sort of this, this antiquated um, uh, settlement world and, and more on, on chain, which that's where the benefits come. That's exactly why I got into the industry was because as a trader and receiving wire transfers from China, you know, could take seven or 10 days for money to reach the account and, you know, so using um, USDC, you know, it's just amazing to me how much, how, what kind of impact that can have on institutional business. Um, um, Joe, um, what do you think um, those in TradeFi and DeFi can do better to collaborate and, um, you know, build a foundation for, for future success? Yeah, I think it starts with events like this, right? I mean, you, you get the community together 
to talk about what the pain points are and, and how that could be something that could be potentially resolved. Um, I have two younger kids as well, right? So part of it is educating that generation on the use cases. We saw something recently about how kids no longer want cash. They want Robux or whatever that's called, you know, on Roblox. So, you know, it's just how, how do we continue that, uh, the education, that awareness on, you know, building on top of that, right? So it's, it's creating that sort of piece of it. So, I, I mean, I, I think that put those together, I think we continue to work with universities out there and colleges and there's so much young talent in this space, people that want to learn about what's out there, how to make this work. And we've been fortunate to hire some really good people because of that. So it's just really just continuing these conversations, uh, working for us, it's our job is we have direct access to the regulator. So it's working with our, our partners in those spaces to try to educate and bring them in on some of these conversations to show them that this can be done carefully and with the risk-minded approach. And uh, it doesn't have to shut down, you know, certain, certain aspects of what we're doing today, but there is a lot we can continue to do. And, and I think, again, this starts with, with conversations like this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> we, um, I know we had, we're not supposed to get too much into regulations, although regulations are on everyone's minds right now. Um, but just briefly, cash. I mean, how do you see these possibilities potentially playing out with regulators and government um, regulation, just briefly. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly the panel before this got into that, and, and Mansi, you were speaking about, um, you know, what the what has transpired over the course of the last couple of weeks is not necessarily a technology or a code problem; it's a human problem. Um, and if anything, it talks about the the challenges with centralization uh, versus decentralization, giving too much power to one entity. Um, so I I can't claim that 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 you know I'm. I, I don't know necessarily in terms of timing what will or should happen. I will say that the gentleman that mentioned that not doing anything, I agree with him that not doing anything is a very bad move. Um, and and what, what does it mean for the U.S. to fall behind? What it means is that this industry is growing exponentially every week. And so uh, today uh, there's roughly about 20,000 developers in Web3. There's a forecast that in the next three years there'll be 250,000 developers. So this is happening. And so what it means for the U.S. to not get involved is that the U.S. does fall behind economically and from an innovative standpoint. And so, you know, what type of regulation comes first? I don't know. Um, you know, certainly the stablecoin regulation um, is something that probably is easier to introduce. Um, Circle is working today actively through our CEO um, and our, our, our um, head of global policy, Dante Desparte, working with regulators, working with, uh, with, working with governments to help have a seat at the table and inform them on what we believe regulation should look like. Um, and so that is certainly a missing piece. It's not just the branding. It's not just the use cases. Is These institutions, in order for them to get involved, and we've spoken with many of them, um, the interest is there. They need to be ensured that it's regulated in a really um, uh, sort of sound way. Um, I think that's happening, and I'm very optimistic that that will happen over the course of the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. And certainly, Jeremy Allaire and Dante Desparte are really very active. There, yeah, uh, Dante calls himself Operation Human Shield, uh, and so <laughs> he's uh, he's in front of uh, he's in front of regulators all the time, educating them about um, you know the the advantages that we believe uh, blockchain and digital assets have, but also how do you uh, build an institution that has the proper risk controls and 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 and, and mitigation uh, that that allows you to thrive while protecting consumers. I think the crypto community has not done a great job of that. There's been more bad news than good news. Um, and so, but I do not believe that the U.S. government can afford to not get involved. And I think they know that. The, the industry is moving at a very, very fast pace and they've got to get in front of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Joe, um, you know, what can digital assets related companies do a better job of to prepare um, working for financial institutions specifically? I think, um, you know, as, as we approach partnering with, the, with folks in the space, um, there's, there's been a few conversations so far around really setting the right pace, the right requirements. Due diligence is a big factor, but it's understanding the business case, the business itself, um, understanding the finances around that as well. That's a big factor here. One of the big concerns from the regulator perspective is, 
there are so many consumers on this platform. What if this business failed? What happens to, the, to those funds and what happens to the consumer side of things? So it's building this foundation for what's expected up front, having the conversations. Is it the right cultural fit? Do do they understand that this this relationship requires a, a a, a lot of risk minded, um, you know, aspects to it. So that's a part of it. And then a, as you continue to partner, you mentioned monitoring, right? Monitoring is a, is a big factor and cipher trace. Some of these, these companies out there that, uh, that bring in this technology to allow us to partner and, and really keep that risk in mind. And so that's an expectation now today. So it's really, it really, I'm driving home risk because that's a big factor as part of this. Um, but it's also, it comes down to the basic business requirements and understanding the really the business value. And can we, from a transparency perspective, can we make this work with our products and, and how do we make it uh, better for the market? Mm. Um, I can't see that five minutes. Um, too bad because we enjoy, we could speak for another hour or more, I think. Um, Steve, um, you know, as an infrastructure provider, you really do see what's going on on the ground and in terms of use cases and who's using what technology. Can you just talk briefly about that? Yeah, um, as I alluded to earlier, what we're seeing in the space is the, the traditional exchanges are really putting an effort into moving into uh, the virtual space. Um, you know, NASDAQ is a great example of that with their partnership with uh, AWS. Um, CME earlier this year announced that they have a partnership with Google. So we're, we're going to see a lot of their um, applications available uh, you know, in the web. Um, and th the reverse of that is we're seeing a lot of the uh, uh, exchanges like Coinbase uh, actually move to physical infrastructure for the reasons that we uh, have been discussing. Uh, more efficient networks, uh, more security, more stability, um, and it, it's a very interesting hybrid of uh, virtual and physical infrastructure that we're seeing across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, it's important to show that, that the infrastructure is solid and people's assets aren't gonna just vanish Absolutely. Um, so, um, anything else? Do you want to? Uh... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think as most people can probably tell, I think uh, it's an exciting time to be building right now. Um, and and I think institutional adoption um, is not an if; it's a when. Um, and I think we've covered many of it in the panels pr uh, prior. Uh, you know, there's a regulatory aspect, there's a mar market education aspect, um, and then there's real applications with businesses that are building really unique use cases um, about the transfer of value, being able to move money around the world using the open, open blockchain, and in some cases even private blockchains. Um, you know, the, I think there's a big belief that real world utility is happening and it's coming soon. Um, we just need to be patient and steadfast. Mm -hmm. And just to, to follow on that, the infrastructure is critical, not only the physical infrastructure, but human infrastructure. Um, you mentioned there are a huge amount of jobs coming uh, in, the, in the near future. So it's, it's definitely happening. It's not an if, it's a when. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think you both covered it very well. Um, and again, I think understanding technology behind it, right? So I think if it's, if it's something that we're trying to wrap in from this more traditional banking side, it's really understanding the use cases around the technology. What can it do to resolve some of these issues? What can it, how can it make things more efficient for us? And ultimately for the client and the end user, make it a much better experience, remove all that friction that there is today and trying to use you know digital assets to purchase something online. It's a pain point today. So how do we make that a much easier process with so many of these Web3 companies out there that have some really good solutions um, it's just th the technology is fun. That's that's the fun part about this. And it's so much. It's just the tip of the iceberg, and we're excited about where it's gonna gonna be heading. Mm -hmm. Are we good, or are we out of time? Okay. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Really appreciate it.